Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be with you to talk today about Hong Kong's regulatory regime for virtual asset trading platforms, that's crypto exchanges, and the most recent developments in this area in Hong Kong. During the course of today's webinar, I'm first going to describe in some detail Hong Kong's licensing regime for virtual asset trading platforms. That will cover the scope of activities that need to be licensed, the various requirements that must be met for platforms to become licensed, their ongoing obligations, and the various restrictions on their activities once they become licensed. And lastly, the statutory offences that cover misconduct involving virtual assets. After that, I'll move on to cover some of the latest developments, including the latest scandal involving unlicensed crypto exchange JPEX, which potentially demonstrates why this space needs to be regulated. So Hong Kong has two licensing regimes governing trading platforms. Under Part 5B of the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorist Financing Ordinance, the AMLO, which came into effect on the 1st of June 2023, all platforms that offer trading in virtual assets that are not securities within the definition of securities set out in Schedule 1 to the Securities and Futures Ordinance, the SFO, for example, Bitcoin, must be licensed by the SFC. Platforms that provide trading in virtual assets that are securities under the SFO, on the other hand, need to be licensed under the SFO for regulated activities Type 1, that's dealing in securities, and Type 7, providing automated trading services. Given the possibility of a virtual assets regulatory classification changing from a non-security to a security and vice versa, the SFC is encouraging virtual asset trading platforms and relevant employees to apply for licenses under both ordinances. Applicants for dual licensing can submit a con single consolidated application online through the SFC's WINGS platform, indicating that they are simultaneously applying for both licenses. According to the SFC's website, there are currently only two licensed virtual asset trading platforms, OSL Digital Securities Limited and Hash Blockchain Limited. Both platforms were already licensed by the SFC to trade virtual assets that are securities under the SFO licensing regime before the AMLO regime came into effect. The SFC has now licensed them under the AMLO to allow them to offer trading in non-security virtual assets. The SFC has not yet approved any of the licensing applications submitted since 1st June 2023 when the AMLO licensing regime took effect, but there are currently four trading platforms waiting for their licensing applications to be approved, and one licensing application has been withdrawn, according to the lists of VA trading platforms on the SFC's website. The implementation of the new AMLO licensing regime means that Hong Kong now complies with certain requirements of the Financial Action Task Force, which I'll talk about as FATF, which is the International Anti-Money Laundering Watchdog. Very briefly, under FATF's interpretive note to FATF Recommendation 15, FATF member jurisdictions, which include Hong Kong, should require virtual asset service providers, usually referred to as VASPs, to be licensed or registered by a competent authority which must regulate VASPs in relation to anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing and monitor their compliance with AML and CTF regulations. FATF also requires countries to apply the so-called travel rule to virtual asset transfers. This requires originating VASPs to obtain and hold accurate required originator information and required beneficiary information on virtual asset transfers and to submit that information to any beneficiary VASP or financial institution and make it available on request to appropriate authorities. FATF compliance was one of the drivers behind Hong Kong's implementation of its regulatory regime for virtual asset trading platforms. Non-compliance would risk Hong Kong being placed on the FATF's grey list of non-compliant jurisdictions. The implementation of Hong Kong's new licensing regime also aligns with the Hong Kong government's stated objective of developing Hong Kong as an international hub for Web3 and virtual assets. In April 2023, ahead of the implementation of the AMLO licensing regime, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority issued a circular to Hong Kong banks, urging them to provide banking services to SFC-licensed virtual asset trading platforms to support what it described as their legitimate need for bank accounts. This was seen as a move aimed at supporting the government's objectives and countering banks' reluctance to open bank accounts for crypto-related businesses. 
The requirements for licensing virtual asset trading platforms are, however, stringent, and licensed platforms are subject to various continuing obligations, including additional obligations for platforms serving retail investors and individual professional investors. Hong Kong's implementation of a regulatory regime for crypto exchanges is also viewed as having created a degree of regulatory clarity in comparison with the US, where regulation is implemented through enforcement actions rather than legislation. Crypto regulation in the US is currently mired in a turf war between the securities regulator, the SEC, and the commodities regulator, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. According to a recent article in Bloomberg, Hong Kong, as well as Singapore, South Korea and Japan, which also have crypto regulatory regimes, are expected to benefit from crypto exchanges moving out of the US. As I'll talk about later, the SFC has taken a number of initiatives over the last few weeks to try and improve investors' understanding of the risks associated with trading on unregulated platforms in the wake of the scandal involving unlicensed trading platform JPEX. The actions of the Hong Kong police force in arresting a number of people involved come as a clear signal that action will be taken against anyone who breaches the regulatory regime. The regulators are clearly determined to prevent the JPEX case from damaging Hong Kong's ambitions as an international crypto hub. Hong Kong's desire to establish itself as a crypto hub is part of the government's wider efforts to establish the city as a cutting-edge financial center. Financial Secretary Paul Chan referred to virtual assets as unstoppable new financial innovations that Hong Kong needs to embrace, while the HKMA's fintech promotion roadmap sets out its vision of bolstering Hong Kong's position as a leading global financial center, offering world-class digitally enabled products and services. In building its regulatory regime, Hong Kong has had the advantage of seeing what has gone wrong in other jurisdictions. For example, in the case of failed US-based crypto exchange FTX, and building provisions into its regulatory regime to prohibit regulated platforms from engaging in the types of activities that put investors' assets at risk, such as lending client virtual assets. While it's true that JPEX has failed in Hong Kong, JPEX is not a licensed platform. If anything, its activities make the case for stringent regulation of virtual asset trading platforms and strict enforcement of the regulatory regime against those who breach its provisions. Looking first at the licensing regime under the AMLO, an entity is required to be licensed if it carries on a business of providing a virtual asset service, which the AMLO refers to as a VA service in Hong Kong, or holds itself out as doing so. Licensing under the AMLO is also required for an offshore entity to actively market, either itself or through another person, to the Hong Kong public any service that it provides outside Hong Kong, which would be a VA service if it were provided in Hong Kong. So an offshore entity that actively markets to the Hong Kong public a VA service that it provides offshore is required to be licensed. The relevant provision is Section 53ZRB3 of the AMLO, and it's the equivalent of Section 115 of the SFO, which applies to securities. In practice, however, the SFC will not license offshore entities since they fall beyond its regulatory remit. The provision therefore operates to prohibit any offshore VA trading platform from actively marking its VA trading services to the Hong Kong public. Failure to comply with the AMLO's licensing requirements is an offence which carries maximum penalties of seven years imprisonment, a Hong Kong $5 million fine and a daily fine of 100,000 Hong Kong dollars for continuing offences. As to what amounts to active marketing for the purposes of Section 53ZRD, the SFC's FAQ says that examples of active marketing include frequently calling on Hong Kong investors to market services, including offering products and mass media programs and internet activities targeting Hong Kong investors. The FAQ lists various non-exhaustive factors it will consider in determining whether services are actively marketed to the Hong Kong public. These include whether there's a detailed plan to promote the services, whether the services are extensively advertised using direct mailing, adverts in local newspapers or broadcasting, or push technology over the internet, and whether the services are packaged to target the Hong Kong public, for example, by being written in Chinese and denominated in Hong Kong dollars. However, we need to be cautious in relying on that interpretation since the SFC argued against its own interpretation in the case of Ng Chu Mui and against the SFC when it asserted the term meant 
no more than marketing in the primary sense of proactively advertising the services to the Hong Kong public. The meaning of the term active marketing was not determined in the case since the services had been advertised extensively in local newspapers. Turning now to what constitutes, quote, providing a VA service, unquote, the AMLO defines this as operating a VA exchange, which is in turn defined as providing services through means of electronic facilities whereby offers to sell or purchase virtual assets are regularly made or accepted in a way that forms or results in a binding transaction, or persons are regularly introduced or identified to other persons in order that they may negotiate or conclude, or with the reasonable expectation that they will negotiate or conclude, sales or purchases of virtual assets in a way that forms or results in a binding transaction. The licensing regime therefore applies to virtual asset trading platforms that operate in Hong Kong, or whose offshore services are actively marketed to the Hong Kong public. The SFC has said that the VATP licensing regime applies only to centralized VA trading platforms that provide virtual asset trading services to clients using an automated trading engine which matches client orders and also provide custody services as an ancillary service to their trading services. The provision of virtual asset services without an automated trading engine and ancillary custody services, for instance, over-the-counter virtual asset trading activities and virtual asset brokerage activities does not require a license. The Hong Kong licensing regime therefore only covers centralized crypto exchanges. It's worth noting that the scope of regulation is narrower than required under the FATF recommendations, under which the businesses that are required to be licensed or registered as VASPs also include businesses that are involved in the safekeeping of virtual assets or instruments creating control over virtual assets. That's cryptographic keys. This would require the licensing of crypto custodians and custodians of cryptographic keys. The FATF VASP definition also covers businesses involved in the transfer of virtual assets, such as virtual asset payment businesses. When the consultation on the new AMLO regime was conducted, the Financial Services and Treasury Bureau explained that it had decided to only regulate crypto exchanges as they were the predominant crypto-related businesses in Hong Kong. The number of standalone crypto custodian and crypto payment businesses in Hong Kong at the time was negligible. However, the AMLO gives the Secretary of Financial Services and the Treasury, the FSTB, the power to amend the definition of VA service by notice published in the Gazette. The government may therefore choose to extend the scope of the licensing regime in the future if it sees fit. Virtual assets are defined in Section 53ZRA of the AMLO. There are three strands to the definition. First, the virtual asset must be a cryptographically secured digital representation of value that's expressed as a unit of account or a store of economic value. Secondly, the virtual asset must either be used or intended to be used as a medium of exchange accepted by the public for the payment for goods or services, for the discharge of debt and or for investment, or must provide rights, eligibility or access to vote on the management, administration or governments of the affairs in connection with or to vote on any change of the terms of any arrangement applicable to any cryptographically secured digital representation of value. The third strand of the definition is that the virtual asset must be transferred, stored, or traded electronically. This definition includes Bitcoin, altcoins, and stablecoins, although, as I'll mention later, the SFC has said that stablecoins should not be admitted for trading by retail investors until they're regulated in Hong Kong. There are a number of specific exclusions from the virtual asset definition. It excludes digital representations of fiat currencies, central bank digital currencies, financial assets already regulated under the SFO, such as securities and futures contracts, and stored value facilities, which are separately regulated under the Payment Systems and Stored Value Facilities Ordinance. The definition also excludes limited purpose digital tokens, which include non-transferable, non-exchangeable, and non-fungible closed loop limited purpose items, such as air miles, credit card rewards, gift cards, customer loyalty programs, and gaming coins. 
As to the licensing regime under the SFO, virtual asset trading platforms that provide trading in virtual assets that are securities within the SFO definition and provide automated traded services in those virtual assets or hold themselves out as doing so need to be licensed under the SFO for regulated activities type 1, that's dealing in securities, and type 7, that's providing automated trading services. As is the case for the AMLO licensing regime, the SFC has indicated that licensing is required only for centralized virtual asset trading platforms. That's trading platforms that provide trading, clearing, and settlement services for virtual assets and have control of clients' assets. The SFC doesn't license platforms which provide peer-to-peer -peer trading in virtual assets between clients, where the trades take place off exchange and the clients retain custody of their virtual assets. As is the case under the AMLO, the SFO also prohibits an offshore entity from actively marketing to the Hong Kong public any services it offers offshore that would constitute SFO-regulated activities if they were provided in Hong Kong under Section 115 of the SFO. That prohibition applies whether the offshore entity conducts the active marketing itself or through another person, and whether the active marketing is conducted from offshore or in Hong Kong. The provision means that offshore virtual asset trading platforms can't actively market their offshore services to the Hong Kong public. What constitutes active marketing is the same under the AMLO and the SFO. While the AMLO and SFO set out the key regulatory provisions for VA trading platforms, the detailed obligations and requirements are set out in various SFC codes, guidelines, and FAQs. Many of the detailed obligations on VA trading platforms are set out in the SFC's guidelines for virtual asset trading platform operators or VATP guidelines. The SFC has also issued a guideline on anti-money laundering and counter-financing of terrorism for licensed corporations and SFC licensed virtual asset service providers and a prevention of money laundering and terrorist financing guideline for associated entities of licensed corporations and SFC licensed virtual asset service providers, as well as FAQs on licensing matters and on conduct related matters. Looking now at the eligibility requirements for licensing, Hong Kong incorporated companies that have a permanent place of business in Hong Kong and overseas companies that are registered in Hong Kong under the Hong Kong Companies Ordinance are eligible for licensing under the AMLO and SFO licensing regimes. Businesses that don't have a separate legal personality, such as partnerships and sole traders, individuals and overseas companies that are not registered in Hong Kong, are not eligible to be licensed as VA trading platforms in Hong Kong. An entity applying to be licensed must be fit and proper which means that it must not be subject to any receivership, administration, liquidation or other similar proceedings, have failed to meet any judgment debt or be unable to meet any financial or capital requirements that apply to it. The VATP guidelines set out financial resources requirements that licensed platform operators must meet on a continuing basis. First, they must have at least 5 million Hong Kong dollars of paid up share capital and liquid capital of the higher of 3 million Hong Kong dollars and the basic amount as defined in Division 2 of Part 4 of the Securities and Futures Financial Resources Rules. They are also required to beneficially own assets that are sufficiently liquid, such as cash, deposits, treasury bills and certificates of deposit, but not virtual assets that are equivalent to at least 12 months of their actual operating expenses calculated on a rolling basis. The SFC also needs to be satisfied as to the competency of the VA trading platform operator and will consider various key elements, including its business model, corporate governance, internal controls, operational review, risk management and compliance, in addition to the combined competence of its senior management and other staff members. A licensing applicant will need to have a clear business model, detailing its modus operandi and target clientele as well as written policies and procedures to ensure continuous compliance with the relevant legal and regulatory requirements. The applicant has to demonstrate to the SFC that it has a proper business structure, good internal control systems and qualified personnel to ensure the proper management of the risks it will encounter carrying on its proposed business as detailed in its business plan. Licensing applicants need to include detailed information on these points in its business plan compliance manual and other 
internal policies and procedures. Platform operators need to appoint a minimum of two responsible officers to supervise their licensed business, who must be approved by the SFC. The main requirements for responsible officers are that at least one responsible officer must also be an executive director of the company, and if the company has more than one executive director, they must all be appointed as responsible officers. In addition, at least one responsible officer must be ordinarily resident in Hong Kong, and at least one responsible officer must be available at all times to supervise each regulated activity or business. Where a platform is dual licensed under the AMLO and SFO, it's required to have two rather than four dual licensed responsible officers to meet the minimum statutory requirement for two responsible officers under each ordinance. The SFC states in its licensing handbook for VATP operators that it will only license overseas residents if they will come to Hong Kong to conduct regulated activities on behalf of a licensed platform operator to which they're accredited. It will not license individuals who only conduct business activities outside Hong Kong. If a responsible officer will be stationed overseas and will visit Hong Kong from time to time to conduct regulated activities, the SFC will impose a non-sole condition on the responsible officer's license. The non-sole condition means that when the responsible officer actively participates in or supervises the platform's licensed business, they must do so under the advice of another responsible officer who is not subject to the non-sole condition. However, itinerant professionals who will only spend short periods in Hong Kong for specific purposes should not be appointed as responsible officers because this is incompatible with their responsibilities for supervising the virtual asset trading platform's business. The SFCs also said that responsible officers must participate in supervising the platform's regulated activities and that licensed platforms should not hire people who act as responsible officers in name only and have no real supervisory role. Responsible officers need to be fit and proper persons to act in this capacity. The fact is relevant to the SFC's assessment of an individual's fitness and properness to be a responsible officer include their financial status and solvency, their educational or other qualifications and experience, their ability to carry on regulated activities competently, honestly and fairly, and their reputation, character, reliability and financial integrity. The SFC will also take into account a person's convictions for offences under the AMLO, the United Nations Anti-Terrorism Measures Ordinance, the Drug Trafficking Recovery of Proceeds Ordinance or the Organised and Serious Crimes Ordinance, and comparable offshore convictions as well as a person's previous breaches of the AMLO. The SFC's VATP guidelines set out the SFC's requirements in terms of responsible officers' academic or professional qualifications, relevant industry experience, recognised industry qualifications, management experience and the Hong Kong Securities Institute HKSI papers they are required to have passed. There are three routes to meeting these requirements. If a person has a relevant university degree, that's a degree in accounting, business administration, economics, finance or law, or internationally recognised professional qualifications in those subjects, they must also have at least three years direct relevant industry experience acquired in the previous six years, two years management experience and have passed HKSI papers one and two. People who have degrees in other subjects are required to have passed HKSI Institute paper one and to have at least three years direct relevant industry experience over the previous six years Two years management experience have passed HKSI papers one and two and have either passed Hong Kong Securities Institute papers seven and eight or completed an additional five hours of continuous professional training within the six months before they apply to be licensed. The last route is for individuals who have attained level two in either English or Chinese and maths in the Hong Kong Diploma of Secondary Education exams or equivalent overseas qualifications. These people are required to have two years of management experience and to have passed HKSI papers one and two. They also need direct relevant industry experience of three years over the previous six years and to have passed HKSI papers seven and eight, or they can have five years direct relevant industry experience over the previous eight years, in which case they must have completed an additional five hours of continuous professional training in the six months before they apply to be licensed. The SFC will recognise an individual's industry experience as directly relevant industry experience if they were a key person involved in the development or in ensuring the proper functioning of a technology platform 
or system that's central to the virtual asset trading platform for which the person will be a responsible officer. Just providing system support, on the other hand, will not be recognized as relevant industry experience. Where a responsible officer's applicant's industry experience largely relates to non-security virtual assets and the person doesn't have experience of dealing in securities or vice versa, the SFC has said that it is prepared to be flexible given that this is a new industry. That's to say that it will consider industry experience dealing in non-security virtual assets as industry experience relevant to type 1 dealing in securities regulated activity under the SFO, although it will impose a licensing condition on the person's type 1 license that they can only provide type 1 regulated activity services for the business of an SFC licensed platform operator. At the same time, it will recognize industry experience of dealing in securities as industry experience relevant to providing a VA service under the AMLO, but will impose a non-sole condition under the responsible officer's license to provide a VA service. This arrangement is intended as a temporary measure which has been adopted for pragmatic reasons due to a lack of talent with both virtual asset and securities related experience at this early stage. The SFC will review whether this provision needs to be retained as the market develops. In terms of what the SFC will recognize as management experience, this needs to be hands-on experience of supervising and managing the business regulated functions in a business setting. Managing the platform staff who conduct the regulated functions or engage in its projects can also be regarded as management experience. Under the VATP guidelines, the SFC will also accept management experience gained in the financial industry unless it's purely administrative, for example, involving human resources or office administration. People who will provide regulated services on, part, on behalf of a VA trading platform, including its responsible officers, need to be licensed by the SFC as licensed representatives accredited to the VA trading platform. In practice, licensed representatives and responsible officer applications can be submitted at the same time. Licensed representatives can only act for the platform operator to which they're accredited for conducting regulated activities. If a licensed representative ceases to act for their principal, the principal must notify the SFC through wings within seven business days. The licensed representative can then apply for a transfer of their accreditation to another platform operator within 180 days. If a licensed representative has previously received a regulatory warning, this must be disclosed in the application form. The SFC expects individuals applying to be licensed representatives to have a basic understanding of the market and of the relevant legal and regulatory requirements. Again, there are three different routes to licensing. Someone with a relevant degree or professional qualification only needs to have passed HKSI Paper 1. People with other degrees need to have passed Paper 1 and have at least two years relevant industry experience over the past five years or have either passed HKSI Papers 7 and 8 or completed an additional five hours of continuous professional training within the six months before they apply to be licensed. The third route to licensing requires individuals with Level 2 in English or Chinese and Maths in the Hong Kong Diploma of Secondary Education exams or equivalent to have passed Paper 1 and have two years of direct relevant industry experience over the previous five. They also need to have completed five additional CPT hours in the six months before applying for licensing or have passed HKSI Papers 7 and 8. The substantial shareholders and ultimate owners of a VA trading platform operator are also required to be fit and proper and must be approved in writing by the SFC. A substantial shareholder is a person who has an interest of 10% or more in the platform operator's issued shares or a person with an interest in the platform operator's shares, which entitles them either alone or with their associates to control the exercise directly or indirectly of 10% or more of the voting power at its general meetings. Someone will also be a substantial shareholder of a VA trading platform operator if they hold shares in another company, which entitles them alone or with their associates to control the exercise of 35% or more of the voting power at general meetings of that company or of a further company which can exercise either alone or with its associates 10% of the voting power at general meetings of the platform operator. An ultimate owner is an individual who owns or controls more than 25% of the issued share capital of the VA trading platform operator. 
controls more than 25% of the voting rights at its general meetings or controls its management. The fact is that the SFC takes into consideration in determining whether someone is fit and proper include the person's financial status or solvency, their educational or other qualifications and experience, evidence of their competence, honesty and financial integrity, their conviction in Hong Kong or elsewhere for any money laundering or terrorist financing offences or other offences involving fraudulent, corrupt or dishonest conduct, and failure to comply with the AML or CTF obligations or other obligations of licensed VA trading platforms. Anyone who proposes to become an ultimate owner of a licensed VA trading platform has to be approved in writing by the SFC. The SFC needs to be satisfied that the platform will continue to be fit and proper if the ultimate owner is approved. In granting its approval, the SFC can impose conditions on the licensed trading platform or the ultimate owner. A person who becomes the ultimate owner of a VA trading platform without the SFC's approval, without a reasonable excuse, will commit an offence for which the maximum penalty is a 1 million Hong Kong dollar fine and two years imprisonment and a further fine of 5,000 Hong Kong dollars for every day the offence continues. The SFC has also introduced a managers in charge of core functions regime for licensed virtual asset trading platform operators, the details of which are set out in the SFC's FAQs on measures for augmenting senior management accountability in platform operators which are based on the manager in charge regime applicable to other SFC licensed entities. The purpose of the regime is to implement the requirement for the trading platform's senior management to assume primary responsibility for ensuring that the platform has appropriate standards of conduct and that those standards are adhered to. Licensed VA trading platform operators need to appoint one or more managers in charge as individuals who are principally responsible either alone or with others, for managing each of the platform operator's core functions. There are eight core functions. The first is overall management oversight, which involves responsibility for the day-to-day -day direction and oversight of the effective management of the platform operator's overall operations. The manager in charge of this function could, for example, be the trading platform's CEO or president. The person's main responsibilities include developing the platform operator's business model, objective strategies, organizational structure, controls and policies, developing and promoting sound corporate governance practices, culture and ethics, and executing and monitoring implementation of board approved business objective strategies and plans, and the effectiveness of the organizational structure and controls. The second core function is key business line which involves directing and overseeing a line of business comprising one or more types of SFO regulated activity and or a VA service under the AMLO. Examples of job titles of individuals the SFC gives for people suited for this role are the head of automated trading services, head of brokerage services or head of sales. The third of the core functions is operational control and review, which is responsible for the establishment and maintenance of adequate and effective systems of controls over the platform's operations and reviewing the platform operator's compliance with and the adequacy and effectiveness of its internal control systems. The manager in charge of this function could, for example, be the chief operating officer, head of operations or head of internal audit. The fourth core function is risk management, which involves responsibility for identifying, assessing, monitoring and reporting risks arising from the platform operator's operations. Examples of individuals who could perform the role are the chief risk officer or head of risk management. The fifth core function is finance and accounting, which involves responsibility for ensuring timely and accurate financial reporting and analyses of the platform operator's operational results and financial positions. The manager in charge could, for example, be the chief finance officer, financial controller or finance director. Sixth among the core functions is information technology, which relates to the design, development, operation and maintenance of the platform operator's computer systems. A suitable person to be the manager in charge could be the chief information officer or head of information technology. Compliance is the seventh core function for which the manager in charge could be the chief compliance officer or head of legal and compliance. That function is responsible for setting policies and procedures for complying with the legal and regulatory requirements in the jurisdiction in which the platform operator operates. 
monitoring the platform operator's compliance with its policies and procedures, and reporting on compliance matters to the board and senior management. Anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing is the seventh core function and relates to establishing and maintaining internal control procedures to prevent the platform operator being involved in money laundering or terrorist financing. The manager in charge could be the head of financial crime prevention or head of compliance. These job titles are given by way of examples only and other people with sufficient seniority and experience could be appointed. The managers in charge of the overall management oversight and key business line functions are generally required to be responsible officers of the activities they oversee. They can be located offshore provided they're accountable to the platform operator. The board of a licensed platform operator needs to ensure that each manager in charge acknowledges their appointment as manager in charge and the particular core functions for which they're primarily responsible. Any change in managers in charge must be notified to the SFC within seven business days of the change. Virtual asset trading platform operators also have to appoint a complaints officer to deal with complaints made to the platform operator and an emergency contact person to be contacted by the SFC in the case of a market emergency or other urgent matter. These people don't need to be licensed. Applicants for licensing as a VA trading platform operator also have to obtain the SFC's approval of the premises they will use for record keeping or documents required to be kept under the Securities and Futures Keeping of Records rules and the VATP guidelines. The premises have to be non-domestic premises which are suitable for storing the relevant documents and records. The SFC will normally only approve premises that are located in Hong Kong. One of the reasons for this is that a Hong Kong location is necessary to enable the SFC to exercise its power to enter premises to inspect a VA trading platform operator's records. To apply for licensing, applicants need to submit Form 1, the corporation's license application, Form 5, the new license application for licensed representatives and responsible officers for at least two proposed responsible officers, Questionnaire 1, the general business profile and internal control summary, Questionnaire 2 for VA trading platform operators, the first external assessment report and the license application fee. Application forms, supplements and questionnaires should be submitted to the SFC through WINGS LIC. Applicants for VA trading platform licenses have to engage an external assessor to assess their business and submit two assessors reports to the SFC. Different external assessors can be appointed to review different areas of an applicant's business. External assessors are expected to be independent, that is to say that service providers for the system should be used by a licensed applicant should not be appointed as the external assessor of that system. The external assessor's phase one report needs to be submitted with the trading platform's license application. The areas of assessment include the design effectiveness of the VA trading platform's proposed structure, governance, operations, systems and controls, with a focus on key areas such as governance and staffing, token administration, custody of virtual assets, KYC, AML, CTF, market surveillance, risk management and cyber security. The external assessor's phase two report must be submitted after the SFC grants approval in principle of the license. This report needs to assess the effectiveness and the implementation of the policies, procedures, systems and controls adopted by the license applicant. Any deviation from the planned policies and procedures must be clearly set out and explained. The areas covered by the second assessment include verification and confirmation that all external service providers, such as providers of market surveillance tools, AML CTF tools and KYC tools, have been engaged and that the systems provided by them are fully adopted as planned and are in operation. It's also required to cover the conduct of a vulnerability assessment to identify, rank and report potential vulnerabilities that may compromise the system and should include internal and external vulnerability scans, as well as the performance of penetration tests on network devices, firewalls, servers, databases, wallets and web applications to identify any vulnerabilities or potential issues. The Phase 2 report must also confirm that major or critical rectification steps have been taken for all medium to high risk items identified in the penetration and vulnerability tests. The SFC will only grant its final licensing approval when it's satisfied with the findings of the phase two report. 
VA trading platform operators need to submit their bank account details to the SFC before their licensing application is approved. As I mentioned earlier, the HKMA issued a circular to Hong Kong banks in April 2023, urging them to provide banking services to SFC licensed virtual asset trading platforms. Supporting the Hong Kong government's push to become a global Web3 and crypto hub, the HKMI Circular urges banks to adopt a forward-looking approach and strengthen their understanding of new and developing sectors and a risk-based approach rather than a wholesale de-risking approach. The Circular also confirmed that the additional CDD measures for VATP set out in the HKMA Circular Regulatory Approaches to Authorised Institutions Interface with VA and VASPs on 28th January 2022 apply only when banks offer correspondence services. For example, an account to settle clients' transactions to overseas VATPs. In other words, the additional CDD measures are not required for SFC-licensed VA trading platforms. It also stated that banks can consider opening an account once a VA trading platform applicant has received the SFC's approval in principle of its license application, rather than insist on waiting until the actual grant of the license. According to the VATP Licensing Handbook and the SFC FAQs on the SFC Regulatory Sandbox on becoming licensed, virtual asset trading platform operators will enter the SFC Regulatory Sandbox to allow the SFC to assess and monitor their delivery of services and internal control systems. The SFC expects this to facilitate dialogue between the SFC and VA trading platform operators enabling platform operators to identify and address any risks arising from their activities. If the SFC decides to refuse a licensing application, the applicant will be given the opportunity to be heard and the SFC will consider the applicant's representations before making a final decision. If the SFC then proceeds to refuse the application, the applicant has a right to apply for a review of its decision to the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorist Financing Review Tribunal and the Securities and Futures Appeals Tribunal. The licenses of VA trading platform operators are granted subject to a number of licensing conditions. These include requirements that the platform operator must comply with the VATP guidelines and must immediately notify the SFC and cease operating a VA trading platform if it becomes aware that it can't maintain or ascertain whether it maintains the required amounts of liquid capital and paid up share capital. The licensing conditions also require VA trading platforms to provide the SFC with monthly reports on their business activities within two weeks of the end of each calendar month and any other information requested by the SFC. Licensed platforms must also engage an independent professional firm acceptable to the SFC to conduct an annual review of their activities and operations and prepare a report confirming that they have complied with the licensing conditions and all relevant legal and regulatory requirements. The first report must be submitted within 18 months of the approval of the platform operator's license. Subsequent reports are required to be submitted within four months of the end of each financial year end and on request by the SFC. Under the licensing conditions, VA trading platforms must obtain the SFC's written approval before introducing or offering a new or incidental service or activity or making a material change to an existing service or activity, including the long suspension or termination of an existing service or activity. The licensing conditions also restrict trading platforms to operating a centralized online virtual asset trading platform for trading of virtual assets on its platform and carrying on off-platform virtual asset trading business and incidental services provided by it to its clients and activities conducted in relation to that off-platform business. SFC licensed VA trading platform operators are required to set up a token admission and review committee, which must be made up of members of senior management who are principally responsible for managing the key business line, compliance risk management and information technology functions. The SFC expects members principally responsible for the various functions to include the corresponding managers in charge of the platform operator. The responsibilities of the Token Admission and Review Committee include establishing, implementing and enforcing the criteria 
for admitting, suspending and withdrawing virtual assets for or from trading and the rules containing the obligations and restrictions on virtual assets. The committee is also responsible for making the final decision as to whether to admit, suspend and withdraw a virtual asset for clients to trade based on the adopted criteria. These criteria and rules must be regularly reviewed by the committee. It also has to report at least monthly to the board of directors of the VA trading platform operator and its reports must, at a minimum, include details of the virtual assets made available to retail clients for trading. Hong Kong licensed VA trading platform operators are required to monitor each of the virtual assets admitted for trading on an ongoing basis, and they have to consider whether to continue to allow them for trading. Regular review reports are required to be submitted to the Token Admission and Review Committee. If the committee decides to suspend or withdraw a virtual asset from trading, the platform operator must notify clients as soon as practicable inform clients holding that virtual asset of the options available and ensure that clients are fairly treated. Under the VATP guidelines, a trading platform's senior management is primarily responsible for ensuring that the plat trading platform and its associated entity have appropriate standards of conduct and procedures in place for their employees and that employees adhere to those standards and procedures. In particular, Senior management is responsible for ensuring that effective policies and procedures are in place to identify and manage the risks associated with the business of the trading platform and its associated entity. The term senior management refers to a platform operator's directors, responsible officers and managers in charge of core functions. I'm now going to talk about the due diligence that licensed VA trading platform operators are required to carry out on all virtual assets they plan to make available for trading and the specific criteria that must be satisfied for virtual assets that are to be offered for trading by retail investors. The SFC requires licensed VA trading platform operators to perform reasonable due diligence on all virtual assets irrespective of whether they will be made available to retail clients before admitting them for trading to ensure that they meet the token admission criteria established by their token admission and review committees. The non-exhaustive factors that platform operators must consider for all virtual assets include the background of the management or development team of the virtual asset or any of its known key members, the regulatory status of the virtual asset in Hong Kong, and whether its regulatory status would affect the platform operator's regulatory obligations, supply and demand for the virtual asset and its maturity and liquidity, including the length of its track record period, which must be at least 12 months for virtual assets that are not securities. This effectively prevents platforms from offering ICO tokens for trading. Other factors that VA trading platform operators have to consider are the technical aspects of the virtual asset its development and market and governance risks associated with it, and the legal risks associated with the virtual asset and its issuer. Hong Kong licensed VA trading platform operators intending to make virtual assets available to retail investors must additionally ensure that the relevant virtual assets satisfy the specific token admission criteria set out in paragraph 7.7 .7 and 7.8 of the VATP guidelines. Retail investors are defined in the guidelines as persons other than professional investors as defined in the SFO and the Securities and Futures Professional Investor Rules. The key requirement is that the relevant virtual asset must be highly liquid. For a virtual asset to be considered highly liquid, it must at a minimum be an eligible large cap virtual asset. That's a virtual asset that's included in a minimum of two acceptable indices issued by at least two independent index providers. An acceptable index is an index with a clearly defined objective to measure the performance of the largest virtual assets in the global market. For example, an index which measures the top 10 largest virtual assets, which is investable, which means that the constituent virtual assets must be sufficiently liquid and objectively calculated and rules-based. The index providers must also have the necessary expertise and technical resources to construct, maintain and review the methodology and rules of the index, which need to be well documented, consistent and transparent. 
The two index providers have to be independent of each other, the virtual asset trading platform operator and the issuer of the virtual asset. In addition, at least one of the index providers must comply with the IOSCO principles for financial benchmarks and have experience of publishing indices for the conventional securities market. Noting that large market cap does not necessarily co correlate with high liquidity, the SFC has said that inclusion in two acceptable indices is a minimum criterion rather than the sole criterion for virtual assets to be eligible for trading by retail investors. Trading platform operators are therefore expected to conduct additional due diligence to ensure that eligible large cap virtual assets admitted for retail trading are in fact highly liquid. Trading platform operators are also required to ensure that a virtual asset to be admitted for retail trading is not a security, as defined in Part 1 of Schedule 1 to the SFO, except where the offering of the virtual asset to retail investors complies with the Hong Kong regulatory requirements for public offers of shares and debentures under the company's winding up and miscellaneous provisions ordinance and or does not breach the restrictions on offers of investments under Part 4 of the SFO. The SFC's prior written approval is required for the admission of any virtual asset for trading by retail clients and the suspension of trading or removal of any such virtual asset. If a licensed platform operator wants to make available for retail trading a virtual asset that fulfills the general token admission criteria but not the specific token admission criteria, it can make a submission to the SFC, which the SFC will consider on a case-by-case -case basis. The SFC said in its consultation conclusions that platforms should not admit stablecoins for retail trading until they're regulated in Hong Kong. The HKMA proposed a new regulatory regime for various activities relating to payment relating stablecoins in its January 2023 conclusion of its discussion paper on crypto assets and stablecoins, which it's planning to implement in 2024. SFC licensed VA trading platform operators are allowed to provide services to retail investors, provided that they comply with a number of investor protection measures covering client onboarding, platform governance, disclosure and token due diligence and admission. Under the VATP guidelines, platform operators have to implement a number of measures when serving investors other than institutional professional investors and qualified corporate professional investors. Institutional professional investors are defined in paragraphs A to I of the definition of professional investors in Schedule 1 to the SFO. Qualified corporate professional investors are corporate professional investors, that's a trust corporation, corporation or partnership within sections 4, 6 or 7 of the Securities and Futures Professional Investor Rules, which the licensed platform operator has assessed to meet certain criteria. The first of these criteria is that the corporate professional investor has to has an appropriate corporate structure and investment process and controls for making investment decisions. The second is that the persons making investment decisions on its behalf have sufficient investment experience. And the third criteria is that the corporate professional investor is aware of the risks involved, which needs to be considered in terms of the persons who make investment decisions on its behalf. The platform operator's assessment of whether a corporate professional investor is a qualified corporate professional investor must be in writing, and the platform operator must keep records of all relevant information and documents obtained in the assessment to demonstrate the basis of its assessment. Platform operators need to undertake a new assessment if a corporate professional investor has not traded virtual assets for more than two years. These provisions mean that platform operators must treat individual professional investors that's individuals with investment portfolios worth 8 million Hong Kong dollars or more, and corporate professional investors that are not qualified corporate professional investors in the same way as retail investors. Hong Kong licensed VA trading platform operators are not allowed to offer trade or deal in virtual asset futures contracts or related derivatives. Some of the key restrictions on licensed virtual asset trading platform operators are that they and their group companies are prohibited from providing any financial accommodation for clients to acquire virtual assets. This prevents them offering margin financing to their clients. Licensed platforms are also prohibited from entering into arrangements with their clients to use clients' virtual assets to generate returns. 
This prevents licensed trading platform operators from providing services such as earning, deposit taking, lending and borrowing. They can't offer clients gifts other than a discount to fees or charges for trading any specific virtual asset and can't post adverts for a specific virtual asset. They're also prohibited from providing algorithmic trading services to clients and from conducting proprietary trading for their own account or any account in which they have an interest, except for off-market back-to-back transactions where no market risk is taken by the platform operator. Licensed platforms are also prohibited from conducting market-making activities on a proprietary basis and their group companies are prohibited from conducting proprietary trading in virtual assets through the platform operator on or off platform. Platform operators are not allowed to open multiple accounts for a single client except sub-accounts. Platform operators must obtain the SFC's written approval before offering any virtual asset for trading by retail clients and before suspending trading of or removing from trading any virtual asset available to retail clients, that is, non-professional investors. Before opening an account for investors other than institutional professional investors and qualified corporate professional investors, trading platform operators are required to assess their knowledge of virtual assets and of the risks of investing in them. Trading platform operators can only open an account for or provide services to investors who lack knowledge of virtual assets if they've provided adequate training to the investor. The VATP guidelines set out non-exhaustive criteria for assessing whether an investor can be regarded as having knowledge of virtual assets. These are whether the investor has undergone training or attended courses on virtual assets or has virtual asset related work experience or prior trading experience in virtual assets. For clients other than institutional investors and qualified corporate professional investors, VA trading platform operators must also assess clients' risk tolerance levels and determine their risk profile and whether they're suitable to trade virtual assets. Clients' risk profiles need to be determined based on an assessment of their financial situation and investment experience and objectives. Except for institutional and qualified corporate professional investors, VA trading platform operators are also required to set a limit on each client's exposure to virtual assets to ensure that the client's exposure to virtual assets is reasonable given the client's financial situation, including its net worth and personal circumstances. Platform operators will be required to notify these clients of the limit assigned to them and to regularly review clients' exposure limits to ensure that they remain appropriate. When making a recommendation or solicitation with respect to virtual assets, platform operators are required, except when dealing with institutional and qualified corporate professional investors, to ensure the suitability of the recommendation or solicitation for the client is reasonable in all the circumstances, having regard to information about the client of which the platform operator is or should be aware of through the conduct of due diligence. Platform operators need to establish a proper mechanism for assessing the suitability of virtual assets for clients. The suitability assessment needs to be made on a holistic basis, taking into account the client's personal circumstances and concentration risk, and the risk return profile of the recommended virtual asset should match the client's personal circumstances. And except when dealing with institutional qualified corporate professional investors, trading platform operators must ensure that any transaction in a virtual asset that is a complex product is suitable for the relevant client, even if the transaction has not been recommended or solicited by the platform operator. A complex product is a virtual asset whose terms, features and risks are not likely to be understood by a retail investor because of its complex structure. The factors to be taken into account in determining whether a virtual asset is a complex product include whether the virtual asset is a derivative product, whether a secondary market is available for the virtual asset at publicly available prices, whether there is adequate and transparent information about the virtual asset available to retail investors, whether there is a risk of losing more than the amount invested, whether any features or terms of the virtual asset could fundamentally alter the nature or risk of the investment, 
or payout profile or include multiple variables or complicated formulas to determine the return. For example, where the investment carries the right for the issuer to convert it into a different investment and whether the virtual assets features might render the investment illiquid, difficult to value or both. Platform operators also need to provide prominent and clear warnings about complex products before and expect and reasonably proximate to the point of sale for or advice regarding complex products. Except when dealing with institutional and qualified corporate professional investors, VA trading platform operators have to take all reasonable steps to prominently disclose the nature of virtual assets and the risks that clients may be exposed to in trading virtual assets on the trading platform. Disclosure must include the risk disclosure statement specified in Schedule 2 to the VATP guidelines. VA trading platform operators are required to disclose a significant amount of information on their websites relating to their business and the rights of their clients. The information required to be disclosed includes information about the platform's business and the services offered to clients and its contact details, its trading and operational rules, its token admission and removal rules and criteria, including the criteria for admitting, suspending, withdrawing a virtual asset for or from trading and the acceptable indices referenced by the platform operator for admitting virtual assets for trading by non-professional investors and its admission and trading fees and charges. Websites also need to disclose any services that are only available to professional investors. The rights and obligations of the platform operator and the client under the client agreement required to be entered into with clients other than institutional and qualified corporate professional investors the client's liability for unauthorized virtual asset transactions, its right to stop payment of a pre-authorized virtual asset transfer, when the platform operator can disclose the client's personal information to third parties, including regulators and auditors, and the available dispute resolution mechanisms, including the complaints procedure. Licensed platform operators need to post information about each virtual asset traded on their platforms. That information includes the virtual assets price and trading volume on the platform. For example, in the last 24 hours and since its admission for trading on the platform, background information about the virtual assets management or development team or any of its known key members, the virtual assets issue date and its material terms and features, the platform operator's affiliation with the issuer and its management or development team or any of its known key members a link to the Virtual Assets official website and any white paper, a link to any smart contract, audit report and other bug reports of the virtual asset, and where the virtual asset has voting rights, how those voting rights will be handled by the platform operator. Platform operators need to take all reasonable steps to ensure that product-specific and other information posted on their platforms is not false, misleading or deceptive. They are also required to disclose their financial condition on request to clients by providing their latest audited balance sheet and profit and loss account filed with the SFC and any material changes adversely affecting their financial condition since the date of the accounts. A licensed virtual asset trading platform operator can only hold client assets, that's client virtual assets and client money, through an associated entity. An associated entity is a Hong Kong incorporated subsidiary of the virtual asset trading platform operator, which is a licensed trust or service company provider under the AMLO, which has notified the SFC that it is an associated entity of the licensed virtual asset trading platform operator under Section 53ZRW of the AMLO and Section 165 of the SFO. The associated entity is not allowed to conduct any business other than that of receiving or holding client assets on behalf of the trading platform operator. Client virtual assets must be held in wallet addresses established by the platform operator's associated entity and must be segregated from the assets of the platform operator and its associated entity. At least 98% of client virtual assets must be held in cold storage, which is less vulnerable to hacking and other cybersecurity risks, except in limited circumstances allowed by the SFC on a case-by-case basis to minimize losses resulting from the platform being hacked or compromised. 
Licensed trading platform operators must have robust internal controls and governance procedures to ensure that cryptographic seeds and private keys are securely generated, stored and backed up. They must also ensure that their associated entities implement the same controls and procedures, which must, amongst other things, restrict access to seeds and private keys for client virtual assets to authorized personnel who have been appropriately screened and trained and provide for seeds and private keys to be securely stored in Hong Kong. Licensed virtual asset trading platform operators must establish a compensation arrangement that's approved by the SFC to cover potential losses arising from, amongst other things, hacking incidents on the platform or default on the part of the licensed platform operator or its associated entity. The compensation arrangement must cover 50% of client virtual assets held in cold storage and 100% of client virtual assets held in hot and other storages. The compensation arrangement can include any or a combination of third-party insurance, funds held in the form of a demand deposit or time deposit maturing within six months of the platform operator or any of its group companies which are set aside on trust and designated for that purpose, and a bank guarantee provided by a Hong Kong authorized financial institution. That's a bank regulated by the HKMA. Licensed platform operators are required to monitor the total value of client virtual assets under their custody daily. If a licensed platform operator becomes aware that the total value of client virtual assets under custody exceeds the amount covered under the approved compensation arrangement, and it expects this to continue, it must inform the SFC and take prompt remedial action to re-comply with the VATP guidelines. Platform operators need to use verifiable and quantifiable criteria when selecting an insurance company. These include a valuation schedule of assets insured, maximum coverage per incident, and overall maximum coverage, as well as any excluding factors. VATPs are subject to the AML and CTF requirements of the AMLO, including the customer due diligence and record keeping requirements set out in Schedule 2 of the AMLO. In the case of non-compliance with the statutory AML and CTF obligations, both the VATP and its responsible officers commit an offence carrying maximum penalties of a 1 million Hong Kong dollar fine and two years imprisonment or seven years imprisonment, if the non-compliance is committed with intent to defraud. SFC licensed virtual asset trading platform operators must comply with virtual asset specific AML CTF requirements set out in new chapter 12 of the renamed guideline on anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing for licensed corporations and SFC licensed virtual asset service providers in addition to the guidelines general AML CTF requirements applicable to SFC licensed entities. The revised and renamed Prevention of Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing Guideline issued by the SFC for Associated Entities of Licensed Corporations and SFC Licensed Virtual Asset Service Providers requires associated entities of SFC Licensed Virtual Asset Trading Platform Operators to comply with a guideline on AML and counter financing of terrorism for licensed corporations and SFC licensed VASPs. Financial institutions which are defined in the AMLO to include virtual asset trading platform operators licensed under the AMLO and or the SFO must comply with Section 13A of Schedule 2 to the AMLO, which applies the requirements for wire transfers under FATF Recommendation 16, which is the travel rule, to transfers of virtual assets. Chapter 12 of the Guideline on Anti-Money Laundering and Counterfinancing of Terrorism for licensed corporations and SFC licensed VASPs sets out detailed guidance on the statutory obligation. This requires that when acting as an ordering institution of virtual asset transfers, a licensed platform operator has to obtain, record and submit the required information of the originator and recipient to the beneficiary institution immediately and securely. When acting as a beneficiary institution, a licensed platform operator has to obtain and record the required information submitted by the ordering institution or intermediary institution. 
licensed platform operators also have to conduct due diligence on virtual asset transfer counterparties. That's the ordering institution, intermediary institution or beneficiary institution involved in a virtual asset transfer to identify and assess the associated money laundering and terrorist financing risks so as to apply risk-based AML CTF measures. Chapter 12 also sets out requirements relating to identifying suspicious transactions and conducting sanction screening of all relevant parties involved in a virtual asset transfer. The travel rule requirements for virtual asset transfers took effect on the 1st of June 2023. However, the obligation on ordering institutions to submit the required information to the beneficiary institution immediately, which means before or when the virtual asset transfer is conducted, has been delayed until the 1st of January 2024. In the interim, the SFC will allow ordering institutions to submit the required information to the beneficiary institution as soon as practicable after the virtual asset transfer, although they must comply with all other travel rule requirements from 1st June 2023, including the requirement to submit the required information securely. Licensed VA trading platforms and their associated entities, that is their Hong Kong incorporated wholly owned subsidiaries that receive or hold client assets, are required to appoint an auditor within one month of the grant of the VA trading platform license and file audited financial statements with the SFC within four months of the end of their financial year. Corporations licensed under the SFO must also submit monthly financial resources returns to the SFC. Licensed VA trading platforms are also required to notify the SFC of their financial year end within one month of the grant of their license. The submission of notifications, regulatory filings and annual returns should be made through the WINGS website. The SFC's prior approval is required for the license changes, including those set out in the table on slides 47 and 48. Application for approval is generally made on Form VA2, except for approval of changes to the licensed entity's substantial shareholders and ultimate owners for which Form VA4 should be used. The license changes requiring the SFC's approval include a change or waiver of a licensing condition, a change of financial year or the adoption of a period exceeding 12 months of the financial year, the use of new premises for keeping records or documents, cessation of business, and a person becoming a substantial shareholder and or an ultimate owner of a VA trading platform operator. The SFC must also be given notice of certain events which are set out on slides 49 to 52 within seven business days. These events include a person ceasing to act as a licensed representative or a responsible officer, a change in the name of a VA trading platform operator, a substantial shareholder or ultimate owner, a change in the business address of a VA trading platform operator or its associated entity, a change in director of the VA trading platform operator or its associated entity or their particulars, and a change in the complaints officer or the emergency contact person or their particulars. Other changes that must be notified to the SFC are any change in the share capital or shareholding structure of the VA trading platform operator, its substantial shareholders and associated entity, and any significant changes in nature of business carried on and types of service provided by the trading platform operator, and any significant changes in its business plan. Changes in managers in charge of core functions or their particulars must also be notified to the SFC, as well as a change in bank accounts, a change of auditor, or of a motion to change the auditor in general meeting. A change in the platform's associated entity or its particulars must be notified to the SFC, as well as changes to the associated entity's wallet addresses and any change in a trading platform's or licensed representative's authorization to carry on any regulated activity by any authority or regulatory organization in Hong Kong or elsewhere. SFC licensed virtual asset platform operators are responsible for planning and implementing a continuous education program appropriate to the training needs of their licensed employees. Training programs can be designed with reference to the licensed corporation's size, structure, scope of business activities and risk management system. 
licensed platforms should assess their training programs annually to determine whether any adjustments are required. Responsible officers need to complete 12 CPT hours per calendar year, of which two CPT hours should cover regulatory compliance topics. Licensed representatives are required to complete 10 CPT hours per calendar year. The guidelines for virtual asset trading platform operators require VA trading platform operators and their associate entities to immediately notify the SFC of various matters. These include any material failure, error or defect in the operation or functioning of the platform operator or its associated entities trading, custody, accounting, clearing and settlement systems or equipment and any material breach or non-compliance or suspected material breach or non-compliance with the SFO, the AMLO or any SFC rules, regulations, codes, circulars, FAQs or guidelines, including the VATP guidelines by the platform operator, its associated entity or anyone appointed to conduct business with clients on their behalf. And to accommodate this requirement, the SFC has upgraded its existing paragraph 12.5 notifications online portal to enable reports of incidents of material breach and non-compliance to be submitted to the SFC electronically. The SFC must also be notified immediately of any resolution passed, proceedings initiated or order made which may result in the appointment of a receiver, provisional liquidator, liquidator or administrator or the winding up, reorganisation, dissolution or bankruptcy of the platform operator, its associated entity, substantial shareholder or ultimate owner or any receiving order or arrangement or composition with creditors. The bankruptcy of any director of the platform operator or its associated entity and the exercise of any disciplinary measure against the platform operator or its associate entity by any regulatory or other professional trade body or the refusal, suspension or revocation of any regulatory license, consent or approval required in connection with the platform operators or its associated entities business must also be notified to the SFC immediately. The AMLO creates various offences in relation to activities in virtual assets that are not securities. Firstly, making a fraudulent or reckless misrepresentation to induce an acquisition or disposal of a virtual asset is an offence, whether the transaction takes place on a licensed VA exchange or not, under Section 53ZRG of the AMLO. The offence carries maximum penalties of a 1 million Hong Kong dollar fine and seven years imprisonment. In addition, in a transaction involving virtual assets, it's an offence for someone to employ any device, scheme or artifice with intent to defraud or deceive or engage in any fraudulent or deceptive act, practice or business under Section 53ZRF of the AMLO. The maximum penalties are a 10 million Hong Kong dollar fine and 10 years in prison. It's also an offence for an unlicensed person to issue or possess for the purpose of issue an advertisement which holds the person out as prepared to provide a VA service under Section 53ZRE of the AMLO. The offence carries sanctions of a Hong Kong dollar 50,000 fine and six months imprisonment. Comparable offences exist under the SFO in relation to the same conduct in virtual asset that are securities within the statutory definition. It's an offence under Section 107 of the SFO to make any fraudulent or reckless misrepresentation <coughs> to induce someone among, um, to deal in securities, which includes acquiring, disposing, subscribing for or underwriting securities. Anyone found guilty of an offence under Section 107 of the SFO is liable to a maximum fine of 1 million Hong Kong dollars and up to seven years imprisonment. It's an offence under Section 300 of the SFO for someone in a transaction involving securities, including an offer or invitation, however that's expressed, to employ any device, scheme or artifice with intent to defraud or deceive or engage in any act or practice which is fraudulent or deceptive. An offence under Section 300 is punishable by a fine of up to 10 million Hong Kong dollars and imprisonment for up to 10 years by virtue of Section 303 of the SFO. A further offence exists under Section 103 of the SFO, where a person issues, whether in Hong Kong or elsewhere, an advert, invitation or other document containing an invitation to the Hong Kong public 
to enter into or offer to enter into an agreement to acquire, dispose of, subscribe for, or underwrite securities unless the issue of the advert invitation or document has been authorised by the SFC under Section 105 of the SFO or an exemption applies. The exemptions most commonly relied on include those for invitations with respect to securities that are or are intended to be disposed of only to professional investors or only to people outside Hong Kong under sections 1033J and K of the SFO. I'm going to turn now to talk about the SFC's disciplinary powers in relation to licensed VA trading platforms and their officers, which are extensive. The provisions of the AMLO relating to VA trading platforms offering trading in non-security virtual assets have equivalent provisions in the SFO for platforms trading virtual asset securities. Under Section 53ZSP of the AMLO and Section 194 of the SFO, the SFC can exercise its disciplinary powers to sanction a regulated person if the person is or was at any time guilty of misconduct or is considered not fit and proper to be or to remain the same type of regulated person. The term regulated person is defined as a person who is or was at the relevant time a licensed VA trading platform, a licensed representative or responsible officer of a licensed trading platform, or a person involved in the management of the business of a licensed trading platform, irrespective of whether that person is licensed. This means that members of a licensed trading platform senior management are subject to the SFC's disciplinary powers, even if they're not licensed, because of their involvement in the management of the trading platform's business. Misconduct is defined in Section 53Z SR2 of the AMLO and Section 193 of the SFO to include any breach of any provision of the AMLO or SFO, a breach of the terms or conditions of a person's license, and an act or omission relating to the carrying on of any regulated activity or VA service for which a person's license, which, in the opinion of the SFC, is or is likely to be prejudicial to the interest of the investing public or to the public interest. Before forming any opinion for this purpose, the SFC is required to take into account its prevailing codes and guidelines on the matter. In determining whether a regulated person is a fit and proper person for the purpose of considering taking disciplinary action, the SFC can, amongst other things, take into account the past or present conduct of the person. In its FAQs, the SFC gives an example of a situation where the SFC could consider bringing disciplinary proceedings against a manager in charge. The situation where the manager in charge fails to ensure the licensed platform's compliance with the SFC's codes and guidelines. As to the sanctions that the SFC can impose on a regulated person, these are set out in Section 53ZSP of the AMLO and Section 194 of the SFO, and they include a public or private reprimand and a fine of up to whichever is the more of 10 million Hong Kong dollars or three times the amount of profit gained or loss avoided by the person as a result of their misconduct or the conduct which led the SFC to believe that they were not fit and proper to be or to remain the same type of regulated person. The SFC can also revoke or suspend the license of a licensed trading platform or licensed representative and revoke or suspend the approval of a responsible officer. The SFC has the power to order the regulated person to take any action <clears throat> specified by the SFC to remedy the person's breach of the relevant ordinance or their act or omission in carrying out any regulated activity or VA service for which the person is licensed, which the SFC considers to be prejudicial to the public interest. If the person fails to comply with that order, the SFC can fine the person a further 100,000 Hong Kong dollars for each day the failure continues after the deadline for compliance imposed by the SFC. Finally, the SFC can prohibit a regulated person for the duration of a specified period from applying to be licensed or to be approved as a responsible officer. Under the AMLO, the regulated person will be prohibited from applying to be licensed to provide a VA service, while under the SFO, the regulated person will be prohibited from applying to be licensed or registered in relation to a regulated activity or applying to be a responsible officer of an SFC licensed corporation or an executive officer of an SFC registered institution. 
As regards the SFC's ability to impose fines under sections 43ZSP of the AMLO and section 194 of the SFO, it has published disciplinary fining guidelines under both ordinances. The guidelines say that the factors the SFC will take into account in determining whether to impose a fine and the amount of a fine include the seriousness of the conduct and whether the person's conduct was intentional, reckless or negligent. In assessing this, the SFC will give consideration to whether a firm obtained prior advice on the legality or acceptability of the relevant conduct from its advisors, or in the case of an individual, whether they sought such advice from their supervisors or the firm's compliance staff. Other factors the SFC takes into account in exercising its power to impose fines include whether the person's conduct causes loss to others or benefits to the firm or individual who engaged in that conduct or any other person, and more general factors such as whether the misconduct will cause any reputational damage to Hong Kong. In the case of a licensed VA trading platform, the SFC will also consider whether the misconduct is the result of serious or systemic weaknesses in the firm's management systems or internal controls. The SFC noted in its consultation conclusions on the AMLO disciplinary fining guidelines that it will take into account the level of sophistication of market participants affected by the misconduct, the positions held by the persons who committed misconduct, and the remedial actions taken by those involved, which it says are reflected in the disciplinary guidelines in the specific circumstances under the items they refer to as the nature and seriousness of the conduct and other circumstances of the firm or individual. Section 53ZR5 of the AMLO and Section 1932 of the SFO further provide that responsible officers and people involved in the management of licensed VA trading platforms may also be considered to be guilty of misconduct and thus liable to disciplinary sanction where the licensed VA trading platform operator is or was guilty of misconduct. Responsible officers and persons involved in the management of licensed VA trading platforms will be regarded as guilty of misconduct if the licensed VA trading platform's commission of misconduct occurred with their consent or connivance, or was attributable to neglect on their part. Section 53ZTH of the AMLO and Section 213 of the SFO also allow the SFC to apply to the Court of First Instance to make various orders against a person who's breached any provision of the relevant ordinance any condition of their SFC license or any other condition or requirement imposed or notice given under any provision of the relevant ordinance. The AMLO additionally allows the SFC to apply for orders against someone who's breached any provision of any code or guideline published under the AMLO, which would include a breach of any provision of the VATP guidelines. The SFC tried to include a similar provision in the SFO, when it published its consultation paper on proposed amendments to enforcement-related provisions of the SFO in June 2022, which consulted the market on various amendments to the SFO. The amendment would have allowed the SFC to seek orders, including orders for the payment of compensation, which I'll talk about in a moment, against someone in breach of the various SFC codes, including the Code of Conduct for Persons Licensed by or Registered with the SFC. The SFC, however, dropped that proposal in the face of widespread opposition from the market, which had concerns regarding the courts being able to impose legal remedies for breaches of SFC codes and guidelines, which are non-statutory, and the fairness of the proposed amendment. Under sections 53ZTH of the AMLO and section 213 of the SFO, the SFC can seek orders not only against the person who's committed the relevant breach, but also against others who have, for example, assisted or conspired with a wrongdoer to commit the breach or being knowingly involved in its commission. The orders that the court can impose include an order to freeze the assets of the relevant person and so-called restoration orders. A restoration order is an order for the wrongdoer to restore the counterparties to relevant transactions to the positions they were in before entering into the transactions. There have been a number of cases in recent years where the SFC has been successful in using Section 213 of the SFO to obtain orders freezing the assets of people involved in insider dealing, for example, to ensure that those assets remain available for future restoration orders compensating the victims of the insider dealing. In the landmark Tiger Asia case, which involved 
insider dealing in the shares of two banks. The court first imposed an injunction freezing the assets of Tiger Asia and three of its senior officers pending the grant of the final orders. It then ordered the unwinding of transactions between Tiger Asia and 1,800 sellers of the bank's shares and ordered Tiger Asia and two of its senior officers to pay around 45.3 million Hong Kong dollars to the sellers to restore them to the position before the share sales to Tiger Asia. This was the first time the SFC obtained a restoration order for insider dealers to compensate investors for losses resulting from insider dealing. And since the Tiger Asia decision, Section 213 has become the SFC's weapon of choice for obtaining investor compensation in insider dealing and other market misconduct cases. Other orders that can be imposed by the Court of First Instance include injunctions prohibiting the contravening conduct, orders appointing an administrator of a person's property, orders declaring a contract relating to virtual assets to be void, and ancillary orders. The SFC has broad powers under the SFO and AMLO to enter the business premises of licensed VA trading platforms and their associated entities to conduct routine inspections, request productions of documents and records, investigate breaches and sanctioned licensed persons involved in the breaches. Possible sanctions include a reprimand, an order for remedial action, a fine and a suspension or revocation of a person's license. The SFC can also appoint an auditor to conduct an investigation into the affairs of a licensed VATP and its associated entities where it has reason to believe that there's been a breach of the AMLO or any code or guideline published under it. The SFC also has intervention powers to impose restrictions and prohibitions on the operations of a licensed VATP and its associated entity in certain circumstances. For example, where it's necessary to protect client assets. The AMLO licensing regime for virtual asset trading platform operators trading virtual assets that are not securities commenced on the 1st of June 2023. And from that date, any unlicensed virtual asset trading platform trading non-security virtual assets and carrying on business in Hong Kong or actively marketing its services to Hong Kong investors will breach the licensing requirements under the AMLO licensing regime unless the AMLO's transitional arrangements apply. So the AMLO's transitional arrangements allow virtual asset trading platforms trading non-security tokens, which operated and had a meaningful and substantial presence in Hong Kong before the 1st of June 2023, to continue to operate in Hong Kong without a license until 31st of May 2024. When considering whether a VA trading platform has a meaningful and substantial presence in Hong Kong, the SFC will consider, amongst other things, whether it's incorporated in Hong Kong, whether it has a physical office in Hong Kong, whether its central management and control and key personnel are based in Hong Kong, and whether the trading platform is live with a considerable number of clients and volume of trading activities in Hong Kong. Operators of pre-existing trading platforms which apply online for a license under the AMLO between the 1st of June 2023 and the 29th of February 2024 will also be deemed to be licensed from the 1st of June 2024 until the earlier of the approval, withdrawal or refusal of their license application. When submitting a licensing application, pre-existing virtual asset trading platform operators need to confirm and demonstrate that they operated a virtual asset trading platform in Hong Kong immediately before the 1st of June 2023, and that on being deemed to be licensed, they will comply with and have arrangements in place to ensure compliance with the regulatory requirements applicable to licensed platform operators. If the SFC finds that a licensed applicant doesn't meet the necessary conditions or doesn't have a reasonable prospect of showing that it's capable of complying with the relevant legal and regulatory requirements, it will notify the trading platform that the deeming provision will not apply to it. The virtual asset trading platform must then close down its business by the 31st of May 2024 or within three months of the date of the SFC notice. Similar provisions apply to individuals performing regulated functions for a virtual asset trading platform operating in Hong Kong before the 1st of June 2023. 
they can continue to perform regulated functions without a license and will be subject to a deeming arrangement from the 1st of June 2024. To be eligible for the deeming arrangement, individuals applying to be responsible officers of a pre-existing VA trading platform must have been performing the relevant regulated function for a VA trading platform, whether operating in or outside Hong Kong, immediately before the 1st of June 2023, and at the time of application, must be performing a regulated function in Hong Kong for the pre-existing VA trading platform. To be eligible for the deeming arrangement, licensed representatives of a pre-existing VA trading platform must be performing a relevant regulated function in Hong Kong at the time of application. Once platforms and individuals are deemed to be licensed or approved as responsible officers, they must comply with all legal and regulatory requirements under the AMLO regime for licensed virtual asset trading platforms. The trans transitional arrangements under the AMLO licensing regime apply only to the trading of non-security tokens by virtual asset trading platforms. There are no transitional arrangements under the SFO. Virtual asset trading platforms intending to offer trading in security tokens need to be separately licensed under the SFO for type one, that's dealing in securities, and type seven, providing automated trading services, regulated activities before they commence operations in Hong Kong. So that brings me to the end of the regulatory regime for virtual asset trading platforms under the SFO and AMLO. I'm now going to move on to some of the latest developments since the implementation of the AMLO regime, in particular the fallout from the JPEX uh, um, affair, which comes against the background of the trial in the US of Sam Bankman-Fried, founder of failed crypto exchange FTX. Both these cases make a fairly convincing case for regulation. The SFC issued a warning statement on the 7th of August 2023, entitled Warning, Virtual Asset Trading Platforms Engaging in Improper Practices. Warning, unlicensed virtual asset trading platforms of the potential legal and regulatory consequences of false claims to have applied for SFC licensing and providing prohibited services, such as virtual asset deposit taking, paying a return to depositors. The statement also warned investors of the risks of trading crypto on unlicensed exchanges, which may not comply with Hong Kong's regulatory requirements for licensed virtual asset trading platforms. As I mentioned earlier, Hong Kong currently has only two licensed trading platforms. According to the warning statement, some unlicensed trading platforms operating in Hong Kong claim to have submitted a licensing application to the SFC when this is not true. If that is the case, these platforms risk committing an offence under Section 53ZRG of the AMLO, which I talked about earlier. That's the offence of making a fraudulent or reckless misrepresentation in order to induce an acquisition or disposal of a virtual asset. According to the SFC, false claims to have applied for SFC licensing can mislead the investing public into believing that the crypto exchange complies with the regulatory requirements for licensing when this is not the case. If the exchange subsequently applies for a license, the SFC says that it will take any misrepresentation as to the exchange's license status into account in determining its fitness and properness to be licensed. The SFC's August warning statement also noted that some unlicensed trading platforms have tried to take advantage of the AMLO's transitional arrangements. Some unlicensed platforms apparently set up new entities to provide virtual asset services in Hong Kong before the 1st of June. 2023 and announced their intention to apply for licenses for these new entities. As we saw earlier, trading platforms with a substantial presence in Hong Kong before the 1st of June 2023 can continue their operations without a license until the 31st of May 2024, but need to apply for a license by February the 29th 2024 to be able to continue operating from the 1st of June 2024. These platforms will need to comply with all the requirements of the AMLO from the date of grant of their license or from the 1st of June 2024 if their license application has not been approved by that date and they're deemed to be licensed under the transitional provisions deeming arrangements. The SFC reminds these trading platforms that the deeming arrangement does not automatically apply to platforms operating in Hong Kong before the 1st of June 2023. 
If the SFC considers that a platform does not satisfy the relevant legal and regulatory requirements or does not have a reasonable prospect of demonstrating compliance with those requirements, it will give notice to the trading platform that the deeming provision will not apply to it under Section 3 of Schedule 3G to the AMLO. The platform will then have to close down its business by the 31st of May 2024 or within three months of the date of the SFC notice, whichever is the later. Investors therefore need to be aware that exchanges that claim to have submitted a license application may not in fact do so and may not be complying with the AMLO's requirements. In fact, before they're actually licensed or become deemed to be licensed on the 1st of June 2024, there's no obligation on a trading platform relying on the transitional provisions to comply with the AMLO's regulatory regime. However, the SFC may refuse to grant a platform a license or allow it to rely on the deeming provisions if the SFC does not consider it to be fit and proper, for example, if it conducts activities that are prohibited under the AMLO. The SFC says in the warning statement that some unlicensed trading platforms are offering services and products that don't comply with the applicable legal and regulatory requirements. These include offering to retail investors virtual assets that are unsuitable for retail trading, offering services in virtual asset derivatives, and offering products such as virtual asset deposits, savings or earnings, all of which are prohibited under the AMLO regime. The SFC warns that in assessing the ATP's licensing applications, it will take into account any previous non-compliant activities that could have been avoided. Specifically, the SFC says that it will take a negative view of non-compliant activities that result in client transactions having to be unwound or a virtual asset being removed from retail trading if that could have been avoided. Separately, in assessing these platforms' licensing applications, the SFC will also consider whether the platforms genuinely intend to rectify non-compliant activities and unwind prohibited transactions in an orderly manner. As I'll talk about shortly, the SFC has published various lists showing the licensed status of trading platforms operating in Hong Kong or actively marketing their services in Hong Kong. These lists do not, however, include a list of trading platforms that are relying on the AMLO's transitional provisions to operate without a license. They do, however, include a list of trading platforms that have applied to the SFC for licensing and a list of suspicious virtual asset trading platforms. The warning statement reminds unlicensed crypto exchanges that they can't operate in Hong Kong until they've been licensed by the SFC, unless they can rely on the tr transitional arrangements for exchanges with a substantive presence in Hong Kong before the 1st of June 2023. It also warns investors that with the exception of platforms on the SFC's list of licensed virtual asset trading platforms, of which there are currently only two, all trading platforms currently operating or promoting their activities in Hong Kong are not regulated by the SFC. The SFC warns investors to be wary of the risks of trading virtual assets on an unregulated trading platform and that they may face the risks of losing their entire investment held on the platform if it ceases to operate, collapses, is hacked, or its virtual assets are otherwise misappropriated. Turning now to JPAX, which was no doubt one of the crypto exchanges the SFC was alluding to in its August 2023 warning statement. As I'm sure many of you will have read about in the press, the Hong Kong police have reportedly arrested 18 people allegedly involved in suspected fraud on the part of unlicensed crypto exchange JPEX, allegedly involving more than 2,000 victims and losses of over 1.5 billion Hong Kong dollars. Other individuals believed to be involved have reportedly left Hong Kong. The main allegations against JPEX are that it made false claims to be regulated and conducted activities that are prohibited under the AMLO regulatory regime. The SFC apparently started investigating JPEX in March 2022 and put it on the SFC alert list in July 2022 when JPEX failed to respond to its request for information. From then on, the SFC and the Investor and Financial Education Council together issued investor alerts on at least nine occasions on their respective websites, social media platforms, and through TV and radio channels, warning of the risks of dealing with unlicensed platforms and related malpractices. JPEX hit the headlines in September 2023, when the SFC issued two public warning announcements warning investors that JPEX's claims to be regulated are false, 
and that some of its activities, including offering high returns on various virtual asset products, are prohibited under the AMLO. It also noted that it had referred the matter to the police due to suspected fraud. The SFC issued its first warning statement with respect to JPEX on the 13th of September 2023. The statement warned investors that JPEX's claims to be a regulated platform were false. JPEX allegedly claimed on its website and in multiple adverts to be a licensed and recognized platform to facilitate the trading of digital asset and virtual currency. The SFC statement warns investors that neither JPEX nor any of its group companies has been or applied to be licensed as a virtual asset trading platform by the SFC. JPEX also allegedly claimed on its website and in local adverts to have obtained licenses from certain overseas regulators to obtain a virtual asset trading platform license, which is not true. Although JPEX is registered as a business entity in various jurisdictions, the SFC said that these ju- the registrations do not allow it to conduct virtual asset trading services. JPEX also made false claims on its website to be regulated by VARA, the Virtual Asset Regulatory Authority of Dubai, and to be subject to what is described as VARA's stricter regulatory standards. Although JPEX does have its headquarters in Dubai, it's not on VARA's list of licensed virtual asset service providers. JPEX apparently also falsely claimed on its website to have a business cooperation with a Hong Kong listed company when that cooperation was actually terminated in 2022 without the listed company making any investments. According to the SFC, various other parties, including social media influencers, key opinion leaders, and over-the-counter virtual asset money changers, which it refers to as OTC shops, have actively promoted JPEX's products and services to the Hong Kong public. They've also allegedly made false or misleading statements on social media, suggesting that JPEX had applied for a VATP license in Hong Kong. The SFC has apparently asked these parties to stop all activities promoting JPEX and its products and services. JPEX allegedly offered unusually high returns on virtual asset deposits, savings and earnings products, reportedly marketing its savings product as providing annual interest or return of 21% for Ether, 20% for Bitcoin and 19% for USDT. If proven, these activities would put JPEX in breach of paragraph 726B of the VATP guidelines, which prohibit even licensed virtual asset trading platforms from using clients' virtual assets to generate returns for their clients or any third party. The SFC also noted in the warning statement that it has received that there have been reports in the media about complaints from retail investors that they could not withdraw their virtual assets from their JPEX accounts or that their account balances had been reduced or altered. There have also been media reports that JPEX increased its fees for handling withdrawals from 995 to 999 Tether tokens for every 1,000 USDT withdrawn to in order to disincentivize clients from withdrawing their virtual assets. The SFC issued its second warning statement on the 20th of September 2023 reiterating its suspicions about JPEX. It also criticized JPEX's publication of confidential correspondence between it and the SFC's enforcement division on its website and breach of the secrecy and confidentiality provisions of the SFO and the AMLO. Section 378 of the SFO and Section 76B of the AMLO require persons assisting the SFC in a statutory investigation or inquiry to keep information confidential. The SFC statements also warn investors of the risks of trading virtual assets on unregulated crypto exchanges and highlight the difficulty of seeking recourse against and obtaining legal recourse from exchanges that have no nexus with Hong Kong. The SFC advises investors to check crypto exchanges licensing status on the SFC's list of licensed virtual asset trading platforms. The SFC also warned investors against relying on investment advice posted on social media and influencers' instant messaging applications, given that influencers are often paid promoters rather than investment professionals. If the allegations against JPEX and the various third parties referred to in the warning statement, the provisions of the AMLO that have been potentially been breached include Section 53ZRF AMLO, which 
As I mentioned earlier, it makes it an offence to directly or indirectly employ any device, scheme or artifice with intent to defraud or deceive or engage in any act, practice or course of business that is fraudulent or deceptive or would operate as a fraud or deception in a transaction involving virtual assets. The other potential offence to which the SFC warning statements refer is the offence under Section 53ZRG of the AMLO, which makes it an offence for a person to make a fraudulent or reckless misrepresentation to induce another person to enter into or offer to enter into an agreement to acquire, dispose of, subscribe for, or underwrite virtual assets. For a statement to be a fraudulent misrepresentation, the person making it must know that it's false or misleading. Both offences carry custodial sentences of up to 10 years in prison, and in the case of Section 53ZRF, and up to seven years in prison in the case of Section 53ZRG. As we saw earlier, Section 53ZTH of the AMLO and Section 213 of the SFO also allow the SFC to apply to the Court of First Instance for various orders against those who've breached the provisions of the ordinance. And in the case of the AMLO, those who breach any provision of the VATP guidelines. JPEX and those who conspired or were knowingly involved in its breach of the AMLO and the VATP guidelines, if proved, may therefore be ordered under these provisions to compensate any victims of JPEX's non-compliant activities. In a sign that the SFC plans to enforce the virtual asset licensing regime strictly, the SFC said in its warning statements regarding JPEX that it will not hesitate to bring enforcement action against individuals and entities that breach the provisions of the VATP licensing regime, including those who are involved in any contravention. Although there hasn't been any official statements of the offences with which individuals involved in the JPEX case have been charged, media reports suggest that they were arrested on charges of conspiracy to defraud. On the 29th of September 2023, the SFC announced its publication of lists of virtual asset trading platforms on its website disclosing the licensing status of various VATPs operating in Hong Kong or actively promoting their services to investors in Hong Kong. Six lists have been published of licensed virtual asset trading platforms. Applicants for virtual asset trading platform licenses, applicants whose license applications have been returned, refused or withdrawn, closing down virtual asset trading platforms, trading platforms that are deemed to be licensed, and a list of suspicious virtual asset trading platforms. The SFC advises investors to verify the license status of VATPs by reference to its list of licensed platforms and to be wary of the risks of investing in unregulated VATPs. However, it notes that it will update the lists regularly, that they may not be completely up to date as changes to the regulatory status of trading platforms may occur between updates. The SFC's list of licensed virtual asset trading platforms sets out the names of platform operators that are licensed by the SFC to offer trading in virtual assets. Investors can access detailed information about licensing platforms, including the regulated activities they're licensed for, their business address, the names of their responsible officers, licensed representatives and complaints officer, the conditions attached to their licenses and public disciplinary actions against them in the past five years. Trading platforms' previous names and their past license records are also available. These details can also be accessed through the SFC's public register of licensed persons. Licensed applicants will be transferred to this list from the list of VATP applicants if their licensing applications are successful. The SFC reminds investors that the list only confirms that VA trading platforms are formally licensed by the SFC and that the SFC does not guarantee the performance or creditworthiness of any SFC licensed VA trading platform. The list of virtual asset trading applicants sets out the names of trading platform operators that have applied to the SFC to be licensed and are waiting for their applications to be approved by the SFC. The SFC's aim in publishing the list is to allow investors to check whether a VA trading platform has applied to be licensed and verify the accuracy of claims it's made to have applied for licensing. However, the SFC makes clear that license applicants on this list are not yet licensed or regulated by the SFC and that their presence on this list does not mean that they comply with the AMLO's regulatory requirements. The SFC also warns investors that a licensed applicant's inclusion in the list does not mean that it will meet the conditions under Schedule 3G to the AMLO for being deemed to be licensed from, from the 1st of June 2024 
if it was operating in Hong Kong before the 1st of June 2023 and eligible to rely on the AMLO's transitional provisions or that there is a reasonable prospect of it successfully demonstrating to the SFC that it's capable of complying with the legal and regulatory requirements applicable to licensed VA trading platforms. Nor does a licensed applicant's inclusion in the list mean that they will be licensed by the SFC and that their applications will not be returned or refused by the SFC. As regards the list of applicants whose license applications have been returned, refused or withdrawn, the SFC will return an application that's incomplete, for example, one that fails to submit all the required information and documents, including external assessment reports, or if there are unresolved fundamental issues. The SFC will also refuse a licensed applicant that it does not consider to be fit and proper to be licensed. The list of closing down VA trading platforms sets out the names of platforms that are required to close down by law within a specified period. For instance, under the new licensing regime's transitional arrangements, a pre-existing trading platform can be deemed to be licensed from the 1st of June 2024 until its license is granted or rejected, provided that it submits its license application before the 29th of February 2024. However, if a pre-existing trading platform applies for license by the February 2024 deadline and the SFC notifies it that the deemed licensing provision will not apply to it, it must close down by the later of the date falling three months after the date of the SFC's notification and the 31st of May 2024. When a trading platform is closing down, it can't provide any services unless the operations facilitate the closing down of the business. During the closing down period, all marketing activities targeting Hong Kong investors are required to cease. The list of VA trading platforms that are deemed to be licensed sets out the names of trading platforms that are deemed to be licensed as of the 1st of June 2024. Where the license application of a, of a deemed to be licensed platform is approved, withdrawn or refused, its name will be transferred to either the list of licensed VATPs or the list of closing down VATPs. The SFC reminds investors that it has not vetted the fitness and properness of these deemed to be licensed VATPs and they may not eventually be licensed. The SFC's list of suspicious virtual asset trading platforms is a list of entities which have come to the attention of the SFC because they are unlicensed in Hong Kong and are believed to be or to have been targeting Hong Kong investors or claiming to have an association with Hong Kong. The SFC is encouraging anyone who's been contacted by an unlicensed firm to notify the SFC by completing a complaint form on the SFC's website. On the 4th of October 2023, the SFC announced its establishment of a joint working group with the Hong Kong Police Force after a high-level meeting on the 28th of September 2023. The working group is made up of representatives from the Hong Kong Police Force's Commercial Crime Bureau, its Cybersecurity and Technology Crime Bureau, and its Financial Intelligence and Investigations Bureau, and from the SMC's Enforcement and Intermediaries Divisions. The mission of this working group is to facilitate the exchange of information regarding suspicious activities and VA trading platforms' breaches of the regulatory regime applicable to them, and to improve coordination and collaboration in investigating illegal activities. On the 25th of September 2023, the SFC announced that it's working with the Investor and Financial Education Council to educate and warn investors about the risks of trading virtual assets on unregulated platforms. These initiatives include the publication of the various lists I just talked about. And the SFC is also proposing to launch a public campaign to raise investor awareness of the risks associated with virtual assets and the potential for fraud through education talks and through the media and social media. So these latest developments indicate that the Hong Kong regulators clearly are very serious about enforcing provisions of Hong Kong's virtual asset trading platform regulatory regime against anyone who contravenes the requirements. So that brings me to the end of the formal part of this presentation. Thank you again for joining me, and I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Bye.